Our guest in this segment is attorney at law, Stephen Skinner. Stephen, good morning to you. Good morning. Great to have you with us, sir. How's your summer been so far? Uh, it's been great. You know, we ha uh, had a street fest in Shepherdstown this past weekend, and I think everybody enjoyed that, coming off of West Virginia Fest in Charlestown a couple weeks before that. So easing into summer. Have you taken your vacation yet? Have you traveled or anything? Is that still to come? You know, that's a TBD and still to come. I have a pretty busy work schedule this summer, so that that I don't have anything locked in. All right. So, well, let's get to work I then. I can't, I can't do the banter. <laughs> uh, let's talk uh, Supreme Court decisions. Uh, first and foremost, the most recent one handed down yesterday dealing with immunity for the president. Your thoughts on this decision, which was a 6-3 decision that cut along party lines, basically. You know, I think the first thing that we have to recognize about something like this, which is, you know, sort of inherently political right now, is that people are viewing it through a partisan lens. Um, and, you know, it's going to take a lot of time to kind of digest what it means. Um, the so, immunity, by the way, let's just talk about what it what it is. There's a concept, and it, it comes from English common law, of sovereign immunity, right? And that means the government can do no wrong. And uh, so it cannot be sued for what it does. And that concept has made its way into uh, American law, and we have various offshoots from that. And probably in this context, most importantly, it would be the, the, the presidential immunity. And so, you know, you could think back to, to a long list of things which um, people are unhappy with and that had significant consequences and which presidents did. You know, when you think about um, – uh, what Reagan did with arms for hostages, you know, there's certainly a question about the legality of that. Um, there are covert operations that a president can authorize and engage in. And, you know, when the state is acting uh, under the director of the commander in chief, we, we certainly generally want that president to feel secure that they're not going to get prosecuted for those kinds of acts. So then we get to, you know, we kind of fast forward to the topic here. And, you know, I, I skimmed over the uh, opinion again, but these, these things are not um, quickly digestible. And you kind of look at the, the higher, um, the, you know, the, the bullet points. And it, it looks like, Everything that we already knew was reaffirmed, but they have pushed sovereign immunity a little bit further um, than presidential immunity, pushed it a little bit further and given the president some more powers. Um, this is consequential, of course, because, you know, the Supreme Court only hears, what, 350 cases a year. So cases like this tend to not come up very often, and we – now are going to live with this for a very long time, regardless of whether the president is a Republican or a Democrat. There's some interesting legal issues that are pretty arcane relating to evidence. Um, and I think I, I was reading um, Justice Barrett. Um, she, she wrote a, a concurring opinion that's kind of specifically targeted one of the evidentiary issues which which made a lot more sense than what the majority did about whether you can use evidence from sort of presumably official business to make the case that unofficial business was a crime for which there's no immunity. So I don't think it's everything that the the left thinks it is. I don't think it's everything the right thinks it is. It is certainly um, – very hyper partisan, and um, you know, I don't. I think there are a lot of people who are very uncomfortable with 
what it does. But we have to to remember that what a president must do to keep us safe and secure is is we must be able to give protection to that president. Otherwise, you have, um, you know, other countries willing to uh, indict our presidents for crimes or war crimes. Um, and, you know, it's, it, there's a there's a line there that we have to uh, assert for um, the safety and security of the U.S. Stephen, this is John Gilstrap. Good morning. <clears throat> so how morning. does this fold over with the impeachment clause for high crimes and misdemeanors? So this really doesn't have anything to do with that, right? Because impeachment is happens within Congress. And um, the uh, he, he was impeached. He wasn't convicted, Trump. And... Um, you, we could deal with a problem like this that way. Um, that would be a political solution. And obviously it's, it's much cleaner. We haven't gotten to that point. We, in, in many ways in the United States, um, rely on shame and honor um, to regulate our politicians. And what we're talking about now and what I think the founders were concerned about um, certainly was that sometimes when you have populism um, take over democracy, that shame and honor don't really work anymore. And so we might have to um, prosecute, criminally prosecute a president for their crimes. So it is not, um, it, it, it does not have to do with that portion of the Constitution generally. So if if a president commits what would normally be considered a crime in office and then he were impeached as a result and convicted, hypothetically, yep. it, that's that's it. That's the final punishment, as it were, is the conviction by the Senate. Right. And, and therefore removal. And it wouldn't the that's would generally be thought of as not being reviewable by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court can't intervene over there. The Supreme Court can intervene in a federal court. Um, and, you know, the what is as interesting sort of in terms of this story as, um, uh, as any of that is it, this almost guarantees that the, the court case may not continue uh, in a speedy manner um, that would allow a prosecution prior to the election. The case was not dismissed. We, we need to remember this. The criminal case against um, Donald Trump was not dismissed, and in fact, it's being sent back um, for further, essentially, clarification before it can proceed. And from a practical point of view, there's literally no way to for it to to begin. Um, I mean, even uh, a a Supreme Court case, uh, there's some procedural issues that delay just by a month before it becomes official. Um, that's fairly typical. So procedurally, this has a big impact on the election politically, but um, th in terms of um, what, what it, it is constitutionally, it is very different from what would happen if the Senate convicted and th therefore removed the president. Stephen, John, Jonathan Bodwell. Um, I mean, my, my thing is, I mean, I see the, the, the left is, you know, up in arms, upset about this. The right is very excited. But, I mean, th this going forward is going to apply to all presidents. I mean, it, Republican presidents, Democratic presidents. I mean, if, you know, three, four years from now, the shoe's completely on the other foot, it's going to be the right saying, oh, my gosh, the Supreme Court messed up, and the left saying they were right. I mean, it's, I think it's one of those things that, that people are jumping from one to another when it can happen to either side. I, I think you're exactly right. Um, and I think it's, that's why these kinds of things, you know, the, court, the Supreme Court right now has a pretty terrible reputation uh, with, with the country. And I think that you know, we, we move forward at our peril when we make decisions about individuals and not about the, the presidency um, in, in general. I mean, someone pointed out 
could could President Biden now determine that Donald Trump is a threat to the safety and security of the United States and order SEAL Team 6 to go after him and then would not receive any consequences for that? You know, maybe he could be impeached, but he wouldn't be criminally prosecuted. You know, this is a this is a line that is where we are way too close to. Um, and if we think about it and, and I don't think, um, I, I don't think that we make these decisions, um, in, in a way that, um, I don't think these decisions should be made with the thought of what's in front of us today, but, but what's in front of us for the next hundred years. Well, most definitely. Do you think this makes the president, do you think this gives the president, you know, a lot more power, unlimited power, more of a, a closer to a dictatorship? I mean, as far as they can just do something with impunity, even if it, if it's, as long as it's a, as long as it's an act that they're performing in their official capacity, I mean, they, they can do what they want with, with impunity basically at this point. Well, I, I do want to say, I think that it, that the the here the ends don't justify the means or they have decided that they need to that um this is about um president trump it's not about the big picture so our our president's going to have much more power um i don't i don't know i mean i don't think we're going to know how this plays out for the next 20 years and i don't know that this is this is not something that happens, right? How many? Well, and they still have many, the like you said before, talking about impeachment. I mean, there is still the check and balance of the legislative branch. That yes, he can't be criminally prosecuted as easily a president, any president, but they can they they can face you know uh, impeachment and then conviction by the Senate still, which which is the check and balance. Or I mean, if I'm the president the and I have that kind of power, I can just have all those senators against me arrested. I can go Julius Good. Caesar on you, man. But, yeah. you know, yeah. remember yeah. what happened. The Ides of March. Beware the Ides of March, Rob. Which yesterday felt like March. Hey, if uh, well, I want to switch gears on here, Stephen, because uh, I want to get to the June 26th decision about the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma that the Supreme Court handed down. Can you walk us through that one? Yeah, I want to walk you through this and tell you, you know, how I'm, I'm pretty – I'm very conflicted about this, but I think the court probably got it right. So this is basically about the opioid crisis, and this involves, this continues to involve certainly the Eastern Panhandle because we we have claims filed in the Purdue Pharma bankruptcy. Just to remind everybody, Purdue Pharma was the architect of Oxycontin and the and creating the marketing myth that um, Oxycontin was or was is not addictive, right? So they created the they created the problem in the beginning, and uh, Purdue Pharma went into bankruptcy, um, and a deal was worked out with Purdue Pharma and the bankruptcy to, for a significant settlement. As a part of that settlement, the Sackler family, which largely owned Purdue Pharma, had agreed to contribute, I believe, $6 billion into that particular settlement. But those members of the Sackler family, you know, who had, you know, profited in, in the billions from it, they wanted a release. They wanted a legal release from this, saying nobody else can, can sue us for anything related to this. And they wanted the bankruptcy court to give give them that blessing. Now, in a bankruptcy, you the, when you file for bankruptcy, the court says to all of your potential creditors, um, you're not going to be able to come after these people again for these debts. That's why you go to bankruptcy. But what they wanted to do was extend it into the third parties, the Sackler family, who did not file for bankruptcy, right? And so this mechanism, um, we, we reached a settlement, we meaning all of the plaintiffs representing local governments, et cetera, with, the, with Purdue Pharma and with the bankruptcy court and with the Sackler family. There were some local governments who dissented, and that's who brought this appeal to the Supreme Court saying, you can't 
let somebody go who's not actually part of the bankruptcy. And that's where the Supreme Court said, you know what, you're right. We can't, this is an abuse, essentially not what bankruptcy is designed to do. So if, if you want to get a release of liability um, for your potential uh, debt to all of these claims, you would have to go through bankruptcy to get the same kind of release. So Purdue Pharma can get go through bankruptcy and be fine. The Sacklers are not. So what this does is it basically throws out the settlement that uh, we had had with the Sackler family, and we're back to um, we're back to I don't I, you know I'm not involved in those negotiations at all. I'm very disconnected from that. But it puts us back to square one in terms of resolving um, the issues with the Sacklers. So what what you know potentially what will happen is we will all everybody will jump on and we'll go after the Sacklers, and perhaps they will have to file for bankruptcy. I, I wouldn't mind if they all wound up with zero dollars because they're, you know, they have been profiting from addiction for 40 years. According to Yahoo.com, the, um, their collective net worth is $10.8 billion. So there's there's quite a deep well to dip into. Does this affect the West Virginia First Foundation and the, the money that is currently in uh, – being used in West Virginia right now? So this, the, the money that we're talking about here is not yet a part of or counted uh, towards the West Virginia First Foundation. These are separate and outside of that. And what we're talking about are additional funds that would flow into our local governments and potentially into the foundation. So the income streams into um, the the foundation are separate and largely they're from the big three distributors. One of the things that I found interesting as I got involved in this many years ago is that when you look at the the folks who who participated in the scheme, um, the manufacturers of opioids are actually much smaller companies than the wholesalers um, and in many cases the retailers too. So it, it, the, the big three wholesalers uh, uh, basically created the lion's share of funding for the foundation and for our settlements, uh, along with some of the big retailers. I thought of you this morning, Stephen, because I passed a Cardinal Health truck on my, on my drive-in. Wasn't Cardinal one of the big uh, middlemen in all this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, they're, they're very much a part of, of the settlement and that, as that money flows into West Virginia and hopefully starts getting spent as quickly as we can since we have a different uh, version of the epidemic. But it's, it's I, I, I don't know, is it worse today than it was um, seven years ago when we started than it was 20 years ago? Hey, we've, we've got about... Four, four minutes left, Stephen. I want to get to Chevron real quick before we run out of time. You want to take that one on now? Sure. So there was another decision last week that basically – that I think is probably as important as anything. It's more important than the, than uh, in terms of our daily life than the presidential immunity decision, and that strikes down something that we call Chevron, which says that when we have federal regulations – the agencies who get those regulations, um, who generate the regulations, also um, interpret those regulations, and that courts should defer to how the agencies have interpreted those regulations. Well, the um, and that gives courts guidance on how to look at particular regulations. This decision um, got rid of the Chevron. Um, case and said courts should interpret the regulations and should not defer at all to how the agencies have um, uh, have interpreted these. This is going to have enormous consequence across the federal government and the regulatory environment, much to the glee of people who don't want to um, or who uh, would prefer to um, add things to our environment. 
Um, so this is going to be very consequential. We're going to be dealing with the after effects of this um, for the rest of our lives. And we will we will see how what well, now we're going to have some judges interpret, you know, liberally, some judges will interpret conservatively. All this stuff will consistently then start getting appealed. Um, it's just going to create a lot more work for lawyers. That's, that's not a bad thing for you guys. Hey, I, uh, yeah. Stephen, I got to say, I mean, I think for, for people who are, are strict constructionists, I mean, I think people who, who look at the uh, Constitution, you know, a little tight, more tightly, this is exciting for them because they felt for years that the federal government overreached and did way more things than, than it was allowed to. 60 seconds, Stephen, your response. Well, just understand that this doesn't do away with the regulation. This is just how the regulations are interpreted. And um, that is, um, you know, the, the, the put, this puts an extra burden on the courts. And what, what is strict construction, right? And why do we have strict construction? And do we now need to go into the intent of what the drafters of each regulation were thinking that day? It's a, um, it's, it's a mess. <laughs> it's an interesting situation for us all. Stephen, how can people get in touch with you if they have any uh, questions or they need your services? Sure. They can give us a call at 304-725-7029, or you can go to SkinnerWins.com. Great to talk with you again, Stephen. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you all. Good being here.